Welcome once again, one and all, the whole shebang, all you kids out there, all you cool groovy cats. We're going back in time in this episode of Terran's World to a time even before myself. We are talking about one of those properties that just seems to have lasted so long, even though it's not as popular as some people might think it is. That's right, we're talking about the critically acclaimed series. Would it be critically acclaimed? Why did I say critically acclaimed? We're talking about the nostalgia acclaimed series that only a few people, I think, really still care about in a huge, intense way. That is, the Masters of the Universe and that good old cat He-Man. Masters of the Universe, this is such an interesting property to me. I'm going to start off by saying my thoughts and feelings about the property as a whole, then we'll jump into the larger conversation. So, He-Man is an interesting character that I did not know about up until very recently. I always knew he existed. I knew that there's a character called He-Man. No idea what he was part of. He-Man himself was always a character I knew about, but the whole Masters of the Universe lore, the whole storyline, the villains, the characters, everything about it, I didn't know about up until a couple years ago when I got super in-depth into it, because... I was just intrigued by it. I just wanted to know more about it. And I think that's a thing that we have to see about Masters of the Universe throughout the ages. In its time, I would say Masters of the Universe was a very compelling cartoon for kids at that time. But as things grow up and we look back at nostalgia, I think there's a warm place in people's hearts for Masters of the Universe, but it didn't gain the cultural popularity that some other stuff did. And that's not a problem, because I do think it has a warm place in people's hearts, and it's still popular, there's still a lot of stuff that you can get of Masters of the Universe, but it just kind of resurfaced recently, you know, because you look at something, and this is kind of getting off topic, but who gives a shit, it doesn't really matter, does it? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I will say right now, you look at those big cartoons from the 80s, with the big toy lines that everybody wanted to get, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has surpassed all of them, just being influential throughout various years, from starting off in the 80s in its comic book run, all the way to the 90s with its movies, the early 2000s with its TV series, which I think is the best series, all the way until now with its new movies with Michael Bay involved in its new cartoon run and the new resurgence of the comic books. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles managed to stay in the culture's zeitgeist more than I think any of the other cartoons of the time had. Transformers, you could say, is very popular too, and it, re it remained to be a very popular thing, but you look at the other big three. I think there are five big cartoons from the 80s. Sure, there are things like Gem and the Holograms and Smurfs that are still very popular today and still very relevant. Maybe not Gem and the Holograms, but there's those cartoons that are very relevant. That you look at the big action characters and the cartoons that people still like to talk about because there's such a great lore behind them. You got Ninja Turtles, Transformers, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, and Masters of the Universe. And while I think Thundercats is probably the weakest of all those five, definitely right behind it, I would put Masters of the Universe. So why are we talking about Masters of the Universe today? Because a while back, I was going to talk about this in its own separate video, but I just didn't do it. It didn't get around to it. didn't really feel like it. You know, things happen. You just don't care enough about making like a 10 minute video just talking about the idea of this movie coming out. So 2019, I think was the release date, December 2019. What studio is putting this out? I can't remember, but a studio, was it Lionsgate? No, that wasn't Lionsgate. One of the big studios just said, let's do it. Let's make that Masters of the Universe movie finally. 2019, December, pretty interesting because is there a demand for this movie? And I know, I keep, I get it. There are fans of Masters of the Universe. I completely understand that there are fans of Masters of the Universe. I am one of those fans, but my fandom didn't start off until later when it started to resurface and become more popular in this thing. And I, I went back and watched some of the old cartoons and that's what got me interested in this. 
I get that you have the hardcore fans that have been influenced by this series a lot, have been really impacted by it, and love it, but you look at people who haven't seen the property, right? People know who Ninja Turtles were. Ninja Turtles, that's easy to market. You know, you got ninjas, they're turtles, kids will love it, it's kind of fun, it's kind of action-y. Transformers, big robots fighting each other. G.I. Joe, a military movie. Masters of the Universe, this is a weird one that you can market to people because you can market it in a few ways, and I don't know how I don't know how they're gonna market this movie. You can do it in the big epic sci-fi fantasy realm where things are incredibly dark and just gritty, exactly like you'd expect if a reboot like this, because it's live action, that kind of stuff happens. Or you can make it exactly what the property is, and that is just a cash grab for toys. And I think we've, we did see a good balance of doing the two of these this year with Power Rangers. And now, I know those are two very different properties, Power Rangers and Masters of the Universe. But just hear me out on this one. You cannot make Power Rangers realistic, dark, or gritty, or this hardcore, epic, just scary, superhero, monster movie... Because it's called Power Rangers. These kids get these suits and they fight a character named Rita Repulsa. That's not scary. That is campy and ridiculous. Masters of the Universe is pretty damn ridiculous. Have you seen some of those characters? One of the main characters in Masters of the Universe. Well, besides Prince Adam. You have Man at Arms. Man at Arms. That is so generic as a name. Orko. That is a stupid name too. Look at some of the villains. Besides Skeletor, which Skeletor I want to talk more about later. Evil Lynn? Evil Lynn. Evil Lynn is not a scary name. That is a ridiculous, over-the-top name. You want to just call her Lynn if you're going to go with a dark way? That's fine. Just completely do it. Beastman? Trapjaw? Merman? Those aren't scary names. Those are ridiculous names that like define their personality. That's all they are. They're just personality-defying names. And I do think you can make this movie successful to a wider audience and do some stuff that people would actually really be interested in and really enjoy to see. You just got to do a few things right. So, like I said earlier, this is a hard thing to sell, but you can do it. Don't make it a dark, gritty reboot, because this isn't a dark property. Skeletor, yeah, sure, There, you can get some dark angles going there, the whole evil villains thing and make them dark and gritty but let's be realistic no one's going to be scared of skeletor if he's wearing his weird costume if you have beast man if you have evil in you can make those characters scary for sure but you want to sell toys masters of the universe has always done one thing and that is sell toys you make these characters scary look at beast man beast man is this giant ape-like creature who's a beast of a man, hence the name Beast Man, if you make that character scary and just fearsome and ferocious and like somebody who's like a, not cannibalistic but kind of like a hunted predator thing where he's going to eat these living creatures, that is fucking terrifying. What child is going to want to play with that toy? If you make Skeletor creepy bizarre and just so dark and evil and give him this really creepy raspy voice where he's just this dark creature like dark side or dr doom or something no kid's gonna want that because he looks stupid and crazy there's a way to do this and here's what i think you make it campy but not too campy you know you can do this kind of thing where Yes, you can sell toys. I think it's exactly what you should do with Power Rangers. Modernize up the story. Yes, it's probably in medieval times or the future. Or I don't know when exactly it takes place. But you can make the story more modern in a modern kind of style of telling story where kids can gravitate towards the characters and the villains and the heroes because of just the way their story is told with them. And you can make it... A lot like Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings has a lot of serious moments in it, and it's a very serious movie, a very intense, gritty movie. But there's a lot of campy stuff in there too. And I think instead of going for this dark, edgy reboot that I'm expecting this to go, where, you know, we see the Ninja Turtles be these six foot beefed up monsters who are dark and mysterious, and they kind of like uh, fix that later with Bebop and Rocksteady in the second movie, just start off with this being ridiculous and having this whole lore about it where the fans know what the lore is you can do the exposition you're gonna have to do the exposition of course but 
don't try to make this dark and terrifying. There's nothing terrifying about Masters of the Universe. And there's been some comic books put out by DC where you can see they can go dark. There's a lot of stuff with Skeletor and Hordak that can make it go dark. I get that. You can definitely make it go dark, but that's for the hardcore fans. And that's different when it's a comic book or if it's a collectible, you can do certain things that are going to get people invested in it more who are already fans. Sideshow put out these really great statues of He-Man, Evelyn, and Skeletor. I don't know if they're doing more. Those are gritty, updated looks on these characters that are terrifying. The Skeletor and Evelyn just look so great and creepy and just realistic. That You can do that look for the movie, but it's not going to sell toys to kids. And you really want to sell toys to kids if you're doing this movie, because that's what the property is known for. Even back in the 80s, okay, let's let's go back to the 80s and talk about that. Transformers, they had some really cool toys in the 80s. Ninja Turtles, Playmates just knocked it out of the park releasing those figures. Do you know how many, like, off-brand, like, back-market bullshit figures were made based off of Masters of the Universe because the toy line was so successful? So many, like, rip-offs and knock-offs. It was so, so weird because of how these toys were made and released. You're going to want to get that here again and there. It's the nostalgia thing, and it's this marketing for the awards kids. So make the movie campy. That's all I'm saying here. You make the movie campy, Lord of the Rings style. Here's what I said before, and I said this in one of my earlier videos when I was talking about things. I think, what could be the next Game of Thrones? I think you put He-Man on television, you can do a lot of interesting storytelling more than you could in a movie i think you can introduce a lot more characters in the tv setting because we know if this is a movie we're not going to have a lot of our supporting cast and you know in a tv series there's a lot of interesting characters in the masters of the universe world we can focus just some on like sorceress or ram man or just focus on these side characters that Maybe won't get a big as chance as they would in the movie. And I think that'd be really good for this property. A really interesting way to get more people invested and involved in the property. And I just want to see something like that happen. I think it could really benefit from being on television. I'm still really looking forward to this movie. And I really hope they do it justice and do it well. But I don't want to see a dark reboot of He-Man. There's nothing scary about He-Man. Well, there's certain things, I guess. But, like, you think about He-Man. You think of that campy cartoon where he's wearing that dumb stupid costume and then Skeletor's got the raspy voice where he's talking like making puns and shit that's what I want to see developed on screen so I'm not going to go super in depth on my feeling about every individual character so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you my thoughts on a lot of the main cast and I'm going to say what I feel about them and then I'm going to cast a few of the main members not a lot of them Prince Adam He-Man he is not a very compelling hero in the terms of it. When he's Prince Adam, I think he's kind of interesting. You can make this character way more interesting than it was in the in the in you know the cartoon, but in the comics they really rectify him, making him kind of different, trying to figuring out how he's a young and upcomer in this world. He's a lot like Thor, and I really hope they go with that kind of story where he's cocky, he's arrogant, and he thinks he's all that, but he's really not, and all these other people are better than him going on in this world. That's how I think you make He-Man work, and that's how you make the character interesting, make him unique, and just brilliant, because if he's just like kind of powerful in everything he does, that's not going to be interesting to watch. We're here to see the hero's journey and the hero's struggle, and He-Man is... Maybe not the best character to show us that, but you make him interesting enough. He can be compelling to watch on screen. And that's all I think we really want to see is our characters done justice. There's a lot of ways that nostalgia plays into this, and that's something I'll get into after. But I'm really excited, and I really do hope that we get somebody good cast as Prince Adam and He-Man. So here's what I th here's who I think should play He-Man. And this is, a, this is a choice. I thought about this a while now. Alan Richson, um, he played Raphael in the new Ninja Turtle movies, you probably know him from Blue Mountain State, he's been in a bunch of other stuff, and he just has this way about him where you can believe that he's tough and scary and this big guy, but he's also kind of fun, little charming guy, and I think that'd be a really good casting for He-Man, make it work, make it interesting and unique, and I like Alan Richson, I think he needs a big role like this, because let's say so Raphael did nothing for his career, He's on Blood Drive right now. If you're not watching Blood Drive, it's fucking ridiculous. I do think you should check out Blood Drive. Holy fuck. Um, he could pull it off. He could do the kind of dumb guy trying to figure his way out in this world. 
because I, I don't know a lot about him. I don't think he's that smart. I mean, he can't be like a genius. So he could definitely pull off that look, do that whole thing. And that'd be exciting to see. So I have Alan Richson as He-Man. I'm going to go right here. This is where the nostalgia plays in for a fact too. Who is the best villain of the 80s in these cartoons? This is a very interesting topic, I think. Cobra Commander, I think, is one of the best. He leads this organization. He's really cool. He's really interesting. Mumra is obviously the weakest. And I think it's just because Thundercats always get swept under the rug. But that doesn't matter. Shredder is my favorite. I'm a huge fan of the Shredder. I think sometimes he gets underplayed in certain things. Megatron, a really great character. What has become the most popular 80s cartoon villain in recent memory? It's Skeletor. Skeletor has become a joke onto himself, you know? And it's kind of a it's a good thing and a bad thing. This is where it goes back to that nostalgia I was talking about when we reach this point where it's cool to be a nerd again. It's cool to like these geeky things, be interested in that. And I think a lot of that has to come from the resurfacing of Marvel Studios and Iron Man and making these things popular to the public. I think it has something to do with that, but recent memories, you gotta remember, a while back when you talked about Master of the Universe, you couldn't have a full in-depth conversation about where the sorceress gets her powers and her relationship to Tila and how Hordak is going to play into a sequel involving She-Ra and all these things. You couldn't have a full in-depth conversation about that. We're in this part of our lives now. We're talking about the nostalgia of He-Man and Thundercats and Ninja Turtles and all these things. It's cool again. There's Funko Pops of all these characters we're talking about. There's collectibles of all these characters we're talking about. And that has to come to do with just the whole resurfacing of these things. And I think one of the best resurfaces we've seen for these things was the resurfaces of Skeletor. I said resurfaces so many times, I just... Wow. The resurgence of Skeletor is one of the greatest resurgences I think we've seen in a long time for a character like this. When all the nostalgia came back and it became cool to like these things again, all the products, the shirts, the merchandise, the cups, the clothing articles, just everything about these characters became cool again. And Skeletor, I think, benefited the most and the worst from it. He became so popular again. People started making fun of the way he talked. He, he became all these different things, all these different collectibles. He became a meme. Skeletor became a meme. There are so many Facebook pages out there posting about things from the 80s and the 90s and all these cartoons and these past things where a lot of it is just focused on Skeletor. And sure, there are things out there too where you're focusing on the dark parts of Skeletor. There's some great artwork on that stuff too. But he has this place in the popular zeitgeist of... People, if you don't know who Master of the Universe are, if I showed you a picture, you couldn't tell me who Stratos was or Trapjaw. And you look, you're like, that's Skeletor. Your mind's going to go to that really high-pitched voice of a guy making fun of Beast Man saying he's going to turn him into a suitcase. That's where your mind's going to go with Skeletor because that's what we perceive him now in today's culture and the way nostalgia came back in this big way. I don't think that's a bad thing. It maybe hinders making him terrifying as a villain now. And we've seen in the comic books that, yes, you can make him scary still. But I'm reading those comic books. In my head, I'm always reading Skeletor in that high-pitched voice. That's not a problem. So here's what I think you should do with Skeletor in the movie. You cast somebody who is both parts dark and charming and kind of fun. So, he, okay, hear, hear me out on this one, guys. If you If I lost you on my casting of Alan Richson, I get it. He's not for everybody, but you are going to be, what the fuck are you talking about when I say who should play Skeletor? All right, here we go. Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor should play Skeletor. Skeletor is this really interesting villain for all the reasons we just talked about, the way he became popular in modern media, the way he just transfixed it into this different kind of villain that we haven't seen before. And Ewan McGregor is kind of like that too. Ewan McGregor can play the dark and creepy stuff. Train spotting, I think, is a great example of how weird and different he can go. But he's also a charming guy, and you, you can't hate him. He's so lovable, he's so fun, but he can go dark. And you need the good balance of that, too. Ewan McGregor's voice, it's not completely high pitch, it's not completely low pitch. He's got a great, nice voice that could definitely pull off this kind of more suave buccaneer, I guess, way about Skeletor that I think could be seen as terrifying. And kind of seen as this really interesting way 
to make the character fresh and unique because it would be a take we haven't seen on him before. And I th- I think I read rumors that Skeletor wasn't going to be in the movie. If that's the case, then fucking shut this movie down because there's one thing you need in every movie. Ninja Turtles, you need your motherfucking shredder. Okay, G.I. Joe, you need your motherfucking Cobra Commander. You're doing Masters of the Universe, you need your motherfucking Skeletor. Because if you don't have Skeletor, nobody's gonna care. It's synonymous with Masters of the Universe, okay? Sure, I can see how you want to build up, maybe get Trapjaw, Evil Lynn in there, and then build up to Skeletor, but that's not what you do. You gotta start with Skeletor in there, and you gotta get Ewan McGregor to play him in this kind of different way. Make make him kind of sassy, too. Make Skeletor kind of sassy. I think that's a great way to make the character, because he's kind of sassy. He's kind of an asshole, and I think that's a great... Ewan McGregor, just an interesting choice that I don't know if everyone's gonna believe me when I say that's a good choice, but I think you could definitely pull it off. And going against Alan Richardson, I think that'd be really good. So that's what I think. And we'll we'll go more in depth later on the whole thing about the nostalgia uprising and how these things became popular again and where Masters of the Universe fits into that. I definitely want to get into that. You know what? Let's just get into it now before we jump into other characters. Masters of the Universe, it's still not insanely popular. I mean, it's cool to have the Funko Pops, it's cool to have the figures, uh, but it's never reached that brand recognition that certain things have. You walk into a Walmart, a Toys R Us right now, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see your Power Rangers toys on the shelves, you're going to see your Star Wars toys on the shelves, you're going to see your Ninja Turtles, your Despicable Me for some fucking reason, you're going to see your Transformers, you're never going to see your Masters of the Universe. You go to a specialty comic shop or a collectible store, you're going to find it that stuff. I think it's never going to reach that level of popularity where it's a mainstream thing to like, but if you are a big fan of the old cartoons of the 80s, if you are a big fan of that kind of stuff, you're going to find those kind of collectibles, those kind of figures, those kind of apparel, the clothing, the sunglasses, that kind of shit you're interested in for Masters of the Universe, because that's what it is. It's never going to be able to surpass its competition in that kind of way, but it's always going to remain popular in the hearts of nerds and geeks who grew up with that stuff. There's so there's a lot of great stuff up there you can find for Masters of the Universe, but it's not like store brand stuff. Okay, there's a uh, Four Horsemen. They work with Mattel. They released this Masters of the Universe classic subscription. Every month or quarter month or something, you get a certain figure sent to you in the mail. I like that idea. That's a great idea, but it's never gonna be like, oh, you can go buy these figures on the shelf. I kind of wish they did that because. I never got into the subscription for the Masters of the Universe Classics figures. I really wish I did, but they started releasing characters that only the obscure fans would know. Again, the Funko Pops, a great example. Those really resurfaced and made everything popular again. It's cool to have these things, but I don't think in the whole popularity of anything you are ever going to walk in somewhere and be like, oh, there's that Masters of the Universe thing. I know what I collect. I know what I like. I don't have any Masters of the Universe apparel. I have apparel for Ninja Turtles, I have apparel for Power Rangers, I don't have anything for Masters of the Universe, because it's just so hard to find. But it's still popular in the whole geek zeitgeist, you know, but in like the mainstream zeitgeist, Masters of the Universe, people know He-Man, they know Skeletor now because he's a meme, that's about it. So there's my little rant on that, and that's all I'll say about that, maybe we'll get into some conversation about figures later, who knows. So that pause was pretty long. I'm not going to edit that. Who cares? So now that we've talked about that, what could it be? What could it be we talk about else? Talk about else? I know exactly what we're talking about still. The characters I like. I like the characters in Masters of the Universe. So I've barely talked about this character in this, and she is my favorite character in Masters of the Universe. Everything about this character I just fell in love with. She is the one reason that I actually want to get into some more collecting for Masters of the Universe because I want to find some stuff on her. And if you haven't figured it out, it's not Evelyn, it's not Tila, it's not Shira, it's Sorceress. I love this character. I got this DC comic book, Masters of the Universe, a while back, and there's this character in there who is being abused by Skeletor, and she kind of is the gatekeeper of Kingdom of Grey's skull. I was so fascinated by this character, I wanted to learn more and research her. She was the character that I really started to fall in love with and got me more invested into the lore of Masters of the Universe. I think the sorceress 
is a really interesting character. And she is definitely one of the essential parts that you need to see in the Masters of the Universe movie. Make her a main character. And don't try to cast somebody young and sexy because she's the mom of Tila and she's with Man at Arms. I mean, let's get some girl in her 40s, late 40s, early 50s to play her. Lena Headey, maybe, that would be interesting. Orla Brady from Into the Badlands, that would be interesting. Get somebody of a little age and prowess that... Michelle Pfeiffer would be kind of cool. Uh, she too old? Who cares? She'd be great in anything. I'm just trying to think of some character actress that would be great in that role. Carrie Russell? She's a little young. She could pull it off, though. I mean, yeah, she probably could if you want to get somebody younger for Tila. But, no, I love Sorceress. The character is so unique. Her costuming is so interesting. And she's a great part of the Masters of the Universe team. Speaking of that team... Let's talk about the heroes that we know for sure are going to be in this movie. We got Sorceress. We got He-Man. We better, better get Tila. Tila is such an important character and such a unique character. She is pretty much the best rival you can get to the character of He-Man. I mean, besides She-Ra. I don't know if... Would She-Ra get her own movie? Well, that what we'd see? I don't know if, we, if we'd ever see She-Ra. If they do, I think she'd get her own movie. And then just spin her off somehow. I don't know. That I, I digress. Who gives a shit, really? It's just She-Ra. She's going to show up some point, right? Who knows? Margot Robbie as She-Ra? Eh, I don't know. I'll stop talking about She-Ra. Tila, a great character, great fighter, important part of the universe. Have her fall in love with He-Man. Have Prince Adam swoon over her, Steve Trevor in Wonder Woman style. It would be such a great romance. Cast Rose Leslie, who is Ygritte on Game of Thrones. Get her another big role. If she's not going to be Poison Ivy, which I really hope she is Poison Ivy, make her, make her Tila. That would be such a great casting. So interesting. So fun to watch. And of course, the big daddy of it all. The coolest cat around. The mustache himself. The big armor guy. Man at Arms. You gotta have Man at Arms in here. And ah, uh, this is... This, to me, is the hardest casting, because there are certain ways you could go with Man-at-Arms. You can make him kind of buff in the dad figure. You can make him the badass warrior veteran, and they'd all work. Who would you cast as Man-at-Arms? Like, oh my god, Matt Damon? Matt Damon would never do this movie, though. That's the, that's the part you get. Tom Selleck. If Tom Selleck was younger, god, you could get Magnum P.I. in there right away. That'd be so cool to see, man. Oh man, I, this is so hard. I, I guess I never really thought of Man at Arms in casting. It's interesting. Nikolai Coster Waldo, and then it was Lena Headey, his sorceress. N no, no, we, w we won't go down that road. That would be kind of creepy to people. Sean Bean. Yeah, there you go. Sean Bean would be a great, great Man at Arms. That'd be so fun to watch. And I, I don't know how I feel about this character. Sometimes I find him annoying, sometimes I think he's an essential part of the team. It depends how you look at it. If we are going to go this serious, dark, gritty route, we're definitely going to need some comic relief. I think that's exactly what you can get with Orko, but I don't want to hear that high pitch like, Hey, Orko, you know, let's get, and here, I've thought about this one a bit. Much like my thing of Ewan McGregor as Skeletor. Hear, hear me out. Hear me out on this one, okay, guys? This this might be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Let's cast Detective Pikachu himself, Danny DeVito as Orko, and literally, literally just dress Danny DeVito up as Orko. Let's not have him floating around with the weird long cape robe. Let's just have Danny DeVito stand shorter than everyone. I love Danny DeVito. He's such a fun actor. He's one of my favorite actors working in Hollywood. I love everything he's in, everything he's done. Let's just have Danny DeVito dress up as Orko on set and be the kind of sassy, sarcastic guy who just kind of like begrudgingly goes along with everything and doesn't really want to be a part of this team, doesn't really want to do anything. That's what I think you should get with Orko. Somebody like that, something fun and fresh and just do something cool. So there, we got our main team pretty much. Cringer, don't have Cringer talk. That's stupid. That was always stupid to me. I hated seeing Cringer talk. Make him a scary cat. That's what you do. Uh, You know... The king and queen, just just cast some, like, regal-looking people. Edward Norton. Edward Norton? Fuck, no. Eric Bana, I guess. Uh, the mom, uh, just, I don't know, Kristen Wiig, I guess. <laughs> That's so terrible. 
That was a terrible idea. I'm sorry for putting that idea in your head. And I don't know, who, would you get any of the other Masters of the Universe? Uh, like Triclops, was he good? Was Triclops good? Stratos, I don't know, Scott Glennis, Stratos. Ram Man, would you make him big and bulky if you did Ram Man? That's an interesting one. Ram Man's a really interesting character. I, I, I don't know where you could go with him. Moss Man, would you do something with Moss Man? Moss Man's weird too. The, see, there's so many of those like random characters you could just throw in there. But if you did a TV series... Boy, you could just have them just appearing all over the place, just doing whatever you want. So, I'll say those, I'll throw Stratos in there too. I'll throw Stratos in there as one of the main guys for my team. Um, so, where do we go with those people on the villains? The Snake uh, Snake Castle? Snake Castle, is that what it's called? We got Ewan McGregor as Skeletor. Best cartoon villain, just in terms of meme and popularity, but evil in. This one's easy for me. Evelyn, you get Vanessa Ives herself from Penny Dreadful. Eva Green, she should just be in every fucking movie. She is such a talent, and she's just so incredible to watch in everything she does. I really want to see her in a big movie like this, and I think Evelyn's a great character. To give her depth and some range and something cool, just to do something unique. Uh, who do you get as Beastman? Andy Serkis? He's better than that. Get, like, some Lev Schreiber. Uh, that'd be kind of cool to see. Lev Schreiber. Idris Elba, if you want to make his voice deep. See, Idris Elba would be an interesting choice, too, for Skeletor. But I feel like that's what you do if you're going dark. In my story, we're going a little fun, lighthearted, little romper. And that's what we got Ewan McGregor for. He's kind of scary still. Maybe you just don't have Beastman talk and be kind of like the orcs in Lord of the Rings where they can kind of talk, but they're not a big deal. They just kind of show up and we don't really do anything about it, so maybe like that. Trap Jaw, just get like somebody in there. I don't know. Pablo Schreiber, get Matt Sweeney in there, do something crazy. Merman, get Jason Momoa uh, to play Merman and Aquaman. That's what we do there. There's a lot of other characters. There's so many fucking characters in Masters of the Universe. I don't even know where... This is... I hope this movie's successful. Because then I want to see more of stuff going on in the Masters of the Universe movie. In sequels and shit. And you can spin off and do Hordak and She-Ra. And we're not going to spin off and get that... Like, what? Castle Grayskull Man movie? We're not going to get that. You know? When we get Filmation... It's all Filmation. When we get, like, the more space stuff maybe didn't they go to space in one of the other cartoons i don't know see i i will tell you i'm not a big big fan of masters of the universe i love the property i love the characters and the designs i think it's really interesting and unique but we're going this is my personal list of the top five cartoons that i mentioned before ninja turtles will always have a special place in my heart at number one everything about that property matters to me I would put G.I. Joe next, just because there's something about G.I. Joe that I really just like, the characters and the, the army building aspect of all the figures and collectibles you can get. And there's more Masters of the Universe stuff than G.I. Joe stuff. Weird, right? Then I'd put Masters of the Universe at number three, Transformers at number four, and Thundercats at number five. That's what I'd do for my list. Let me know what you put. Where'd you rank those five? That'd be a really interesting thing to see, because then I could go back and we could talk about it. And definitely in another episode, I will go seriously more talk about, like, you know, Ninja Turtles or G.I. Joe or Transformers, if you want to hear that kind of stuff. And maybe I'll do another one talking about Masters of the Universe closer to the time of the release of the movie. Maybe you want to know more about certain episodes I liked or that kind of stuff. Let me know. This is a really fun topic. I really did have fun talking about this with you guys. So let me know what you think. If you liked this portion of Terran's World, if you like me talking about Masters of the Universe, if you think Ewan McGregor is a good Skeletor, let me know. I'd be excited to see what you guys have to say. So we're going to jump right into the next topic. Let's do that. Look, we all know every news outlet already did their coverage on this story and the topic and gave their points of views, but... As a fan of Star Wars, as a fan of film, and as a fan of directors, I wanted to give my take on what this means going forward. If you've been living under a rock and you don't know what I'm talking about, Disney has fired Phil and Lord from... Phil, Lord, and Chris Miller, I'm sorry. Lord and Miller is what I meant to say. My bad, not editing that out. They've been fired from the Han Solo project and they've been replaced with Ron Howard. Now, this isn't uncommon. 
directors getting fired from projects for big studios. Edgar Wright walked away from Ant-Man. We've seen these kind of things happen before. But this late in the game is really damn shocking, and it's a big surprise for everybody who was involved in the project. When they were fired, when Lord and Miller were fired, there was only three and a half weeks left of principal photography and then the reshoots scheduled that they were going to shoot for the Han Solo movie. Three and a half weeks of principal photography, and then they're fired due to creative differences. Okay, I get that you're firing them for creative differences. You have a vision. You have a certain story you need to tell. I completely understand that. But if you couldn't tell something was wrong before you had three and a half, half weeks left, then this is on you, Disney. This is on you, everybody involved that's not Lord and Miller. Because you're looking at the dailies, you're watching the shoots, you're going to make sure everything's going right. If you're f seeing something in the footage you've seen before that isn't right, that there's the creative differences, it's too comedic, it's not the tone you're looking for, it's not the Han Solo you're looking for, and it takes you that long to figure out that it's not, so now you have to do all this retracing of everything, go back and reshoot a lot of these stuff with Ron Howard, that's on you. I get firing Lord and Miller, I do, but if it took you this long to realize that what they were doing isn't what you were up for, then that's, that's on Disney, that's on Lucasfilm, that's on everybody involved. And you know what? I completely understand it. This isn't a movie that you can just jump into the comedy with. I see where they're trying to go with Lord and Miller. They're these funny guys. They make great properties. But Han Solo isn't 22 Jump Street. Especially at this point in his life. We've seen Han Solo in the saga before. So this is going to take place before we see Han Solo where he starts off in 1977 Star Wars. We know what he's like in that. He's sarcastic. He's kind of dry. We can't have a 22 Jump Street like Han Solo and Lando acting like a buddy cop before that happens. I completely get that. And I'm not saying everything Lord and Miller do is exactly like 22 Jump Street or any of the properties they worked on. I'm not saying that at all. But we know their comedy style. And even though they're not these big names, you know their kind of style of comedy and their kind of style of story. So I completely get why, you know, if that's not going to work out, then fire them. I get that. It just took them a long time to realize that. And it also shows something. And I can, ple I can see this from both sides. I don't want people to think, you know, I'm not being unbiased. Because I really think this worries me a lot about Disney going forward. This shows me that they know the story they're trying to tell of Han Solo. I like that a lot. I completely get that. I'm really happy they know what they want to do. They know where the story has to end and where it has to progress to. That's great. That is a really good thing to have. You know exactly what you need to tell because we already have pre-existing knowledge of this character that's going to happen after the events of this movie. I love that. That's great. It's good you know exactly what you're trying to do and exactly what you want to tell. It just worries me that we're not taking risks anymore. And you know, that's not a big deal. But it worries me because you get these two directors, Lord and Miller. They got a creative style. They got a sense of wonder. They're, they're great guys. The Last Man on Earth, hilarious show. The Lego Movie, hilarious. They know comedy. Han Solo can be a comedy movie, and it can, and I think they could have made it work if they just agreed to do some of the narrative changes that Disney wanted. And I get they want to keep their tone, they want to tell their story, and it makes sense that they were fired, but I wish they weren't. I think, as a fan of film, I would have liked to seen the completed version of Lord and Miller's and see where that takes us. If there's a lot of improvising on set, that's okay. I think that really helps benefit a movie. But I can see it on the other side too. This is a Han Solo movie leading up to Star Wars A New Hope. We have a certain way Han Solo has to be. That's I get that. So, where does this leave us in terms of going forward with Disney? Well, I see it kind of like this. We've seen the same kind of problems kind of happen with Rogue One. But Gareth Edwards agreed to play ball. He, studio didn't like the way things were ended and they had to rechange the whole last act of the movie. They re-edited so much stuff, made so many put so many changes in there. None of the trailers were actually in the movie. <clears throat> Lord and Miller, I respect them for not compromising and being like, "Yeah, you can change our product." They want to make their product, that's great. Go on the Flash. They'll they'll let you make whatever the fuck you want over there at DC. That's great. And I'm really glad that they stuck to their guts and they said, "No, this is what we're going to do. This is the story we want to tell." That's cool. I'm proud of them. And you got so many people worried because of this. 
And it, it it is worrying. And yes, you can get Ron Howard in there. A great director. A critically acclaimed director. He's great. He's he's He can do comedy. But he's also this kind of guy that... you you I guess you can push him around, but it's not going to be like you're pushing around because he's part of the family. He knows these people well. He's worked with them before. He's going to be able to finish this project and do something great with it. That's going to leave Lord and Miller's stuff in there. I don't know what's going to happen now. How much of this movie are they going to have to reshoot because it's too improvised? It's not the kind of narrative or comedy that they were looking for? It's it's interesting. I would like to see both versions of Rogue One. The one that Gareth Edwards did and the one that they had to do the reshirts on. This is the same kind of thing. It just goes to show you that Disney and Lucasfilm, they're not 100% sold on the saga films yet. I mean, on the non-saga films yet. Because this is two movies now where there's been massive reshoots. They've had new people doing different things. They have so many changes coming on. And it's just a really bizarre process that they've been going through i don't understand why they can't just trust the filmmakers to do something great i get it we live in this age now of star wars fandom where everything has to be canon every little thing ties into a previous thing but you hear some of the comments ryan johnson made about the last jedi and how he had so much creative control to take the story in a new direction that's because we there's nothing after that right he's just continuing on with something already happened but because we keep going back in these saga films, we need to do these things just to make it feel canon and to make sense to everything around the story. I get that. But as somebody who is a big fan of directors telling their story and having their influences, I would have been fine if we see this standalone movie and it's like 21 Jump Street. Not completely like 21 Jump Street, but it has those elements, that kind of comedy, that kind of editing, that kind of story being told. Because I do think that could work for a young Han Solo. It could work for Lando. And I was kind of thinking, what if Donald Glover took over the project instead of Ron Howard? I feel that kind of comedy, if you've seen Atlanta, you know the kind of comedy I'm talking about. That could work more for what they were going for. But this guy, he's doing so much already. He's doing everything. I get why they don't want him to step in and direct this movie i really it would be really cool if he did though i will say i would love to see donald glover step up and be the next big guy doing a star wars film wow he's already a lando perfect casting but i'm worried about this movie it makes me wonder too if it is it going to be pushed back to december we know that they want to stick in may they want to win back may i get that that's a great idea you you should try to get may back that's a big summertime it's a great thing but december's worked for you too and now that we're going to have these reshoots, we don't know how much of the movie is going to be reshot. We don't know if it was something to do with Lord and Miller and that angle. And they're just going to reshoot all the stuff they wrote or their improvised stuff. We don't know. And this also has to be hard on Alden Ehrenreich. Because, you know, this guy is just doing what the directors tell him. And they're like, hey, you're doing great. Keep improvising. Keep trying to be Han Solo-like. And now you have Kathleen Kennedy, you have the big studio heads coming in and they're telling you, no, you're doing this wrong. That's got to hurt you too. If this kid didn't have enough pressure on him already, Alden's got so much pressure on him now because he's trying, he's replacing Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford in the most iconic role of his, arguable. Is it, is Indiana Jones more popular than Han Solo? Let me know what you think. I think not. This is, this is a risky movie this movie is ballsy it's risky and everything they've done so far has just got me a little worried that this movie isn't going to live up to the hype that people want it to rogue one was a great movie because we didn't know any of the characters sure vader was in there yes tarkin was in there yes but we didn't know the story we didn't know what these characters are going to act like we know how han solo and lando and chewbacca we know how they're going to have to act and that's going to be really risky going forward and doing your whole thing. Because there's already precedented material that they have to become. This is kind of the problem, too. They got new actors, and that's not a big deal. But still, they're going into these legacy characters, pretty much. And just replacing them in a younger version. It's tough. This movie had a lot of problems going forward with people thinking no it shouldn't happen you lose two great directors over creative differences that would potentially make the movie more fun and free and be more original than another star wars film that's tough you bring in ron howard that's a comforting name i'm glad it's ron howard i trust him i know he can complete this project i want to know what they're gonna have to reshoot and what they're gonna have to do because that is intense and that is a lot of stuff that's gonna have to be changed 
and I'm excited to see where it goes, but it's worrying me. I don't know if I want to see an Obi-Wan, if they're just going to do these kind of things again. If they're just going to have to do reshoots, and it's not going to be enough what they want in canon. Boba Fett and the Bounty Hunters, that's another story. You can go all over the place with that. But if this doesn't work, I don't think we're going to get that Obi-Wan announcement for a while. I really hope we do, though. Because Ewan McGregor, he'd be great. Bring him back. We, we all want Ewan McGregor back. But it's Han Solo stuff. I'm really scared about this movie, and I really don't want to be, because it shows weakness on both the parts of the directors, a little. I'm glad they stuck to their guts and said, no, this is a story we want to tell. If not, you know, we'll go direct Ezra Miller. That's great. But it also shows weakness on the studio that they didn't know that there was a problem until this late in the game. Not a big deal, like I said, but it's worrisome, and it's really hard just to think that's the problem. So let me know what you guys think of the Han Solo stuff, if this movie's worrying you or not. I know it's been out for like a week, why are we talking about it now? Because cause this is my show, damn it, and I want to voice my opinions, you bitch. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the last one. It's really short, guys. I'm definitely going to touch more on this subject next week when we do the Spider-Man review. Why did Skype just update? I don't even have Skype. Sorry about that. I'm not going to edit this. That, yeah, who gives a shit? I don't even know if you guys heard that. Skype did a thing. So, I'm doing a Spider-Man Homecoming one next week, but I want to talk about this really quick. Carnage is in the Venom movie. Sony has announced they're doing, they're going to do these Spider-Man movies, even without Tom Holland or Marvel's approval. Emmy Pascal seems to think it's going to work out in the good, even though sad Kevin Feige is the new sad Affleck. Which is funny, it's exciting, I'm excited to see where that's going to go and what's that going to become. Venom is a very good idea to start your movie with. If you're going to do this whole universe without Spider-Man or with Spider-Man, we don't know. Venom's a good way to launch it. Because if you start with somebody else, you know, it's weird. Venom seems like the kind of character that obviously is spun off from Spider-Man, but has the potential to be good in his own way, and I think that's a really good idea for them to stick with is to make Venom the main character and the hero. I think you should go Flash Thompson, that's just me. Maybe people think Eddie Brock, but I think you should go Flash Thompson, especially if we're gonna have Carnage as the bad guy. It's just a little more dynamic, you know, we're seeing the guns and the kind of the hero, spy, thriller, military man side of things, instead of just two of these big brute forces fighting each other in this dark and intense way. I think you can do the R rating. Tom Hardy is definitely great as whoever they're gonna put him as as Venom. And I think you need somebody equally as maniacal and kind of soft to play Carnage. I can't really think of anybody off the top of my head to play Carnage. But there's definitely a lot of potential for this movie to be good. And I do think it's going to be good. I have a lot of high hopes for this. There's no way Tom Hardy would sign on for something like this if there wasn't the potential of a great script, a great team behind it because he knows how to pick his projects and this seems like something he wouldn't just jump into willy-nilly expecting the world but i'm really excited for this project and carnage is the bad guy a father and son fighting that's really personal make it flash thompson that's all i'm saying make tom hardy flash thompson i think that's a good idea unless it is in the marvel cinematic universe and that weird kid from the grand budapest is flash thompson and then that way he should never be venom because that kid, I like that kid. I do. Don't make him do anything. Because that kid is weird. And just kind of a weird kid. But man, I'm just going to keep rambling on for a bit longer. Venom is good. Sony, good. Get this project done. Don't do Mysterio or Craven. That's just stupid. Black and Silver, I can kind of get behind. I just don't think it's a good idea. Start with Venom. Do Venom only, I guess that's what I was saying. So, good for you guys, I guess. That's going to be great. So let me know what you guys think of Venom and Carnage and Mysterio and all those people doing their movies. And I will catch you in the next installment or the next video or whatever we're up to these days. Good luck.